today's session. With me today are two fantastic panelists. We have Rick Sarr, PowerWise technologist. Welcome, Rick. Thank you very much. And Joy Taylor, marketing manager. Welcome. Thank you, Tom. A lot of great stuff to cover today. Before we jump into our conversation, just one quick housekeeping tip as usual for those of you joining us live today and who are logged into the GoToWebinar interface. We, of course, as always, want this to be a very interactive session. We encourage you to ask a lot of questions. Just type those in the interface, and I'll make sure to ask those on your behalf. And with that said, I think we can go ahead and get started. So take us away. Thank you, Tom. And thanks, everyone, for watching um, today's webinar. Um, in today's webinar, we'll learn about, um, first, we'll review the power consumption of the digital subsystems in various applications. Um, and then we'll go into explaining what uh, PowerWise adaptive voltage scaling technology is about. And at the um, last section, we will explain how to implement the ABS into your systems. Um, <clears throat> Joy, as you know, uh, today energy efficiency is on everybody's mind, right? So if you look at the various industries that uh, National addresses, pretty much every single one of those can benefit from energy savings. Not only the mobile space, which has traditionally been where people try to save power, primarily to increase battery life, Right. and uh, usability, but also in things like uh, data centers and wireless infrastructure. Uh, the cost of ownership and the operating cost of those installations is is rising. So when um, equipment is purchased, what they do, they look to see what the overall operating cost of that equipment is going to be over time. And it may actually be uh, a more significant decision than the actual purchase price. Yeah, that's um, and that's a really growing trend right now because of the um, data-intensive uh, multimedia that we have today with you know YouTube um, streaming video live um, you can use it on from your mobile handset but um, all of those things also need to be processed elsewhere in the infrastructure that is built out as well <coughs> that's a very good point as a matter of fact uh, Cisco did a recent study and they said by 2013 64 percent of the uh, traffic to mobile handsets will be video interesting it's a lot of uh, information it's a lot of video yeah yeah so um, so in some of these applications, um, target applications, we have broken down into um, some of the examples we have here. For example, the base stations that Rick just kind of talked about um, and the power consumption breakdown. Yeah, you can take a look and see that uh, <clears throat> the most inefficient thing in here is the RF pa uh, power amplifier. But if you remove that and look at the, uh, the actual infrastructure of the, of the base station itself, about... 15% of the energy is dissipated at the baseband processors, which are digital processing elements, so either ASICs or some kind of a DSP processors. Yeah, and you can also see that um, cooling also taking another, you know, a, a quarter um, of the power consumption as well, because you know these when they run at um, they run at very very high temperature, and you have to keep these um, cases are at a certain temperature, so. Uh, they spend a lot of money um, also cooling that. So if we can reduce some of these power consumption um, in various areas, such as in the digital subsystems area, then you can also um, collectively reduce the effort or um, the power consumption of um, cooling that system as well. Sure. You actually will see that in the next slide in the, uh, in the computing and uh, data center type infrastructure. Their cooling costs are, are actually even higher. Um, and a lot of the, uh, the energy is going into storage and processing and also in the infrastructure of interconnection between all of this. And that, that, that can be as high as 50% of the energy going into the system. Yeah, and I think this trend is also growing as well because um, even though now it's already at about 50% total of processing and storage and memory, um, I think in the, you know, the data centers are actually growing out everywhere and being built um, in many, many um, locations and these are actually huge data centers um, as well. So that trend is really growing in you know the data processing, power consumption of, of the data centers, and the numbers of the data centers that are being built um, worldwide as well. Yeah, it's so a big problem. We're looking at megawatts, um, you know, in 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 power here, right? So not um, smaller ones. But, um, so it sounds like, from what you're saying, that the impact or the effect of, of, of mobile devices is pretty large on, on, on the infrastructure. Right. Oh, yeah, it reaches all the way back to the data center. Wow. Right. Yeah. And um, if you're talking about the mobile devices, um, we also have a power consumption breakdown graph here as well. 
because the mobile device themselves are very, very much processing um, centric, data processing centric as well, especially the newer ones and the future ones that, um, that we'll be seeing because of the multimedia um, usage and the capability and, and the content that's available today. Um, so in, in this graph, you see that um, this is an older type of handset. You see baseband and apps processor um, amount to about 20% of the entire breakdown, um, entire power consumption breakdown of the systems. But this trend is actually going to grow much, much faster when um, with the handset that are enabled with multimedia download and uploads. Yeah, in fact, if you look at this graph, you can see that the displays actually occupy a large percentage of the energy consumption as uh, handsets move away from the classical LCD type displays and move to uh, progressive frame LCD and other uh, technologies like OLED, it will become a smaller percentage of the overall power consumption, which will also increase the uh, percentage that are occupied by the applications and baseband processors. And they will actually increase in performance required for more multimedia and rich content processing. So it's, a, it's going to be a continuous ongoing trend. So if you kind of had to summarize the top two or three trends related to, to, to mobile power consumption for, for everybody to, to keep in mind, what would those be? So for mobile devices um, and also infrastructure and other applications, um, the trend is that there's a huge amount of multimedia and data intensive um, things that need to be transmitted back and forth all the time. So therefore, the power consumption of the processing engine or ASIC or SOC that are in the systems are increasing tremendously and um, it is one of the challenge that the designer the system designers have in order to design their end device um, is to keep those power budget down and they're looking for a better way to um, to do a power delivery um, technique to those you know ASIC and SOC and, and uh, processor instead of the traditional you know just provide a fixed voltage and 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 that's it for the system so yeah it's a okay. good takeaway Great. So with that, um, now that we've <clears throat> taken a look at the different um, systems and the power consumption that, um, that you have in the digital subsystem, now we'll look at the um, adaptive voltage scaling technology and how that can um, help you reduce power consumption in the processing engines. So in um, a traditional power management delivery, as, um, as you can see, and it's been used for, you know, uh, probably decades and even some in today's now it's um, is still being used. Um, you can see that it's a fairly inefficient system when you have a, um, a digital processor in any of your system that's being powered by a, a voltage regulator that is a fixed voltage. Um, this means that that fixed voltage is um, being applied there, um, only one voltage level. It doesn't take um, into account of any temperature or process compensation, and it's also not taking advantage of some processors have um, different mode of operation, such as um, standby or um, full mode or idle, where the, frequent, the operating frequency of the processor is actually decreasing at different level and different steps. Um, so it's, the voltage is still being applied at one level is, and not taking um, advantage of that. Actually, you can see some of the effects of that on this next slide. If you uh, remember that the power dissipated in CMOS uh, type processes is a square function of the supply voltage. And then if you take a look, and just keep that in mind because it's an exponential type of, of a, a re, a relationship. If you look at this graph, you can see this is a distribution um, of various different uh, devices from either across lots or across temperature. And they vary, the process will vary in speed. It'll either run slow or run fast. But when you design a system, especially in this, in, without any type of intelligence, you have to always take into consideration the slowest silicon that you get from your from your yields. So in this particular case, to run the slowest particular uh, parts at the required speed of the of the system, you have to power it at 1.2, even though a large percentage of the parts that you would receive would also run at 1 volt or at 0.9 volts. If you could know that, you could dramatically reduce the amount of energy that those parts consume. And you can see that in the graph. So, so when, you, when you do it on a fixed voltage, you are all the way on that left side. You assume that all the parts are slow. You have no, no input. Right. So as um, in the previous slide that you, that you saw, um, the voltage regulator doesn't have any information <clears throat> that is inside the processor. It's just um, supplying a fixed voltage blindly, right? It doesn't have any intelligence or any information that they, 
that they can get um, from inside from the processor. So it doesn't know if that is a pro um, process-wise as slow or typical or fast silicon. So it's just applying um, the worst case scenario, sure. which is the highest um, voltage that it can do to apply to make sure that, you know, whether you have fast, slow, or typical, it's all always going to be working. And you can see from that equation that Rick just pointed out that if you apply the worst case scenario, the, um, the highest voltage, your power consumption is, is, is going to be the maximum power consumption. And these numbers are always guard banded as well. So Right. So so it sounds like based on what you're saying that the traditional power management definitely has its 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 inefficiencies. Absolutely. And in this case, uh, something to take away from this slide by looking at it is that this really is a power system based on the worst case scenario. Right. That is correct, yeah. Okay. We just had a question that came in as well, and the question is what is the y axis of this graph? Oh, the uh, the y-axis is um, actually the quantity of parts that come out of the yield. So, in other words, if I took um, uh, a whole group of lots and I took all those components and I sorted them, this the uh, the y-axis of this would be how many of those devices fall into this these various bins. Yeah. Okay. So you can look at it as um, a distribution or over um, process um, speed in this case, so the distribution of of that process. Okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So as um, we mentioned before that in the fixed voltage scheme, um, you don't have any information about the processor, so therefore you're just applying the worst case scenario voltage. Um, then in, in, um, there is another voltage scaling scheme um, that has also been, been used. It's a next step up from the fixed voltage scheme. Um, this one is called the dynamic voltage scaling or DVS. So in this case, uh, the frequency to voltage table, lookup table is being utilized. And it's the next step up because it does get some information from the digital processor or ASIC to give to the voltage regulator to adjust some, um, some voltage accordingly. So you can see here um, some of the table that is um, frequency to voltage lookup table that's already there. Basically, this is a predefined um, frequency to voltage, and it's you know, uh, processor specific um, to see what those predefined levels are. And with this one, basically, with that built-in table, it's being communicated to the voltage regulator by an interface like I2C, and the voltage regulator adjusts the voltage accordingly. It's still a pretty big step. It's not a granular, um, granular step. And in this case, you're not compensating for temperature or process um, compensation, as we've seen in the previous um, slide. That because this one you actually still don't know whether you're not whether you have a slow or fast or typical silicon you don't have that information you're just taking advantage of the frequency scaling primarily so no <laughs> compensation or process or temperature variation so it's not the most maximum power saving voltage yeah, scheme is, that you can have this is an open loop right. type of control it just basically changes the voltage regulator and it has only knowledge of the frequency shifts that it wants to make and that's the only thing it has. So. So to summarize, so DVS, I'll make sure that I'm getting this right, DVS is an open loop voltage scaling system based on a lookup. Table. That's correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. We just had a question come in as well, and the question is, what are the advantages of using ABS versus uh, binning? Binning. 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 Uh, companies are binning, and in some cases they feel that's adequate. Well, actually, uh, on the prior side, we talked about bins, actually. We, we talked about the difference there. The thing with, uh, with binning is you still have to guard band in those particular selections. So what binning does is they, they basically test parts at, uh, <clears throat> through their different, across the corners of the different speeds, and they, they actually blow bits inside of the part that says if this part runs faster, this part runs slow. So in the system, the PMU can adjust the voltage for that particular Part, but it's still running a fixed voltage, and it also, in that particular scenario, doesn't compensate for temperature variation or process variation. So they still have to guard band within that bin. It does take, it does, uh, it's sort of, another again, step. another step. Right. It's like, kind of like the DVS approach, um, but it's, it's sort of in between this and probably right. the fixed voltage. And b <clears throat> with binning, um, you get into a, a much more um, <sighs> manufacturing heavy end um, as far as investment, and, and it, it's a Another way to implement it, but I think it's a much, much more um, costly overhead type of, well, type of implementation because when you bin, you have to be able to say, okay, in the manufacturing flow, you have to bin 
how many times and in the design if you've been in you have to do <coughs> timing and closure many many points of those and you have to mark those type of products in the different ways and in different bins so there are some <coughs> things that are also much more involved in, in binning that okay. versus the ABS and then you, you can see that um, and now we can explain what yeah. ABS is about and and how it's different than binning. Sure. See, ABS is a closed loop system. So what happens is we have a, a piece of uh, intellectual property that's inside of the, the digital ASIC or the SOC. And it basically is the hardware performance monitor. It's constantly looking at the, the, the performance of that particular device. It feeds that information to a thing called the APC, the advanced power controller. And what that does is it makes decisions on whether to increase or decrease the voltage based on the current performance of the, of the part. So if the temperature moves a little bit, it can compensate continuously as that changes the performance of the device. The, uh, the APC then talks to the energy management unit, which can move the voltage up and down as finely as 5 millivolts. So you can see that you can get very, very fine granularity with the control on the v VDD of the, of the device. Right. So as you can see that for, with an AVS implementation, you have um, an intelligent system that's inside your digital processor, right, to get that information of the process. As you can see, that fast process can run at a lower voltage. You can take advantage mm -hmm. of that by getting that information and um, sending it through the APC through the PWI interface and get the energy management unit to uh, um, adjust the voltage accordingly. And that adjustment is actually running continuously in real time. And the, the granularity of that voltage scaling is 5 millivolt type of step. So you can see that you're actually getting a, uh, the most minimum voltage level that's being applied to your processor based on that processor's process and temperature Profile and therefore saving the most um, the most energy saving. So in this case, um, you can compare it to binning as that um, since you have an intelligent system that sits inside the processor and know what process um, profile looks like and which voltage um, can be applied to it to to maximize um, the energy saving, then you can actually el eliminate binning um, in a way because you already. Mm. Um, it's auto binning. Uh, yeah, basically, <laughs> it's, it's doing auto it on its own. Right, it's doing <laughs> automatically. You, you just have one bin, and each of these um, energy management unit, because it has a system, the intelligence system in there, can just close the loop and apply the most optimized voltage there for each and individual processor. Yeah. For the least amount of energy right. consumed. Yeah. Right, and then you can eliminate eliminate binning entirely. So, so, so that's one of the ways. So with with ABS, the, the the power control is a closed loop and it's a continuous process and it, it, it monitors itself. That's right. right. That's right. Okay. We've had several questions that, that are, are coming in, and the first question uh, is still related to binning, and it's, uh, can we quantify the costs of, of binning? Well, there's, there's actually several factors. There's the cost uh, that the ASIC uh, manufacturer puts on the OEM for doing the binning process, but there's some other hidden costs, and those can actually show up in the power supply, because as you bin, you have to uh, keep the tolerance of the supplies much tighter, so the cost of that PMU might actually go up in order to keep the, the, uh, the value that that particular bin requires. The more bins they make, the tighter the tolerance gets, so the, the right. more requirements are put on the PMU. So you may pay a lot more for your PMU, even though uh, you think you're saving a lot more energy, so the cost may go up. Yeah, or you have to configure it into that tight range for mm -hmm. each and individual platforms and, and do a different design every time. Um, while if you use AVS, it's automatically adjusting for the optimized voltage um, in the system without you having to um, specially design or con configure yeah. that voltage range in that um, voltage regulator. But each system's different, so to quantify yeah. it, you have to look at the individual right. applications. Okay. Um, next question that, 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 that came in, it's, it's a scenario-based question. So let's say that you had someone who expressed concern that by changing the voltage, that they not only address a frequency variance, uh, but they're worried that they lose sight of critical timing parameters, so rise and fall times, control of race conditions, et cetera. And that their concern could be that uh, the, these parameters aren't guaranteed to be linear with the variances that they're wanting to measure. What's the best way to handle that? So um, 
With the adaptive voltage scaling implementation, you can see that we put these intelligence in the pros in the digital processor or ASIC. So what we do is um, these IPs are being integrated. We work closely with the ASIC vendor or processor vendor to make sure that um, when we integrate these IPs in there, um, the time enclosure, you know, the the clocking and um, basically the holding time and all of those logics, making sure that those are all meeting the designs um, in order for the HPM and the APCs um, to make sure that the voltage that is being sent to or what is being sent, um, it's it's still meeting that um, that time enclosure. Yeah, the APCs actually so. have the ability to be <clears throat> programmed to prevent any right. bad things from happening where you would go outside the normal operating range of, of the process in its attempt to try and reduce energy consumption. Right, and, and for every... Um, um, processor ASIC that we work with, um, we actually work closely with them to integrate this IP. So therefore, we would um, verify those um, various things that um, he just mentioned to verify that um, the system is working properly and there's no timing issues there. Okay. I um, think that covers the questions for now. Yep. Thank you. So one other thing I want to point out is, well, um, the AVS implementation a lot of time people think that, oh, because it's, the voltage is, is, is dynamically um, changing, so it, it only changed um, or saved the, the energy in the dynamic term. So if you look at the um, energy formula that we have on the screen, you can see that the, the voltage um, supply relationship to the energy consumption is actually for the dynamic term, you're actually saving the V squared, proportional to the V square of the energy saving. And on the leakage term, you are so actually... Um, getting that saving as well, but it's a linear term. So you actually save both of the terms, dynamic and leakage, when applying AVS. So this slide kind of sum up, you know, the DVS versus AVS. Um, a lot of times people um, don't know the difference or have some uh, misconception of, you know, what's the difference between sure. dynamic and um, adaptive voltage scaling. So you can see that on the left-hand side, the DVS has um, a predefined lookup table based on the frequency scaling. Um, the step level are not as granularity, and it's not a continuous um, closed-loop configurations where versus um, AVS, which take uh, in account to the process and temperature compensation, and is continuously up optimizing that voltage um, being supplied to the digital logic in, um, in a closed-loop continuous way. Yeah. So this slide really is just a side-by-side -side comparison. That's correct. It. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, graph. Actually, what we have here is a good comparison between ABS and DBS. In this particular uh, scenario, this is a two-step open loop um, DVS scenario. So on the left, if you look at this set, there's two sets of curves. There's the DVS set, which is near the top, and they're very uh, tightly uh, near each other. And then there's another set, which is the AVS curves below them. The, uh, if you look uh, starting down near zero megahertz and going up in frequency, you can see around 50 megahertz uh, a step on the DVS curves. What's happening here is that the uh, decision process inside of the, the system has decided that the process cannot run above this particular frequency at 0 0.9 volts, which is where it starts. And so it switches to 1.2 volts, and that's where you see that large jump in power consumption, and then it continues to uh, dissipate more power as the frequency goes up. Uh, below it, you can see that AVS continuously just um, looks at the performance of the particular device and adjusts the voltage accordingly as the frequency increases. So you gain two things. One is you don't have that large step anymore, and you also gain the guard band back, which you can see as you get near the, uh, the end of these curves. Uh, the fixed voltage at the end is there is really no savings. It's it's exactly the same as if you had a fixed VDD. Right. Um, and in here you can see that the ABS curves actually uh, save significant power over the over the DVS curves. So in terms of of one of the terms that I'm seeing on the slide is a two step open loop. So that's depicted on, on the graph here. Which one is the two step? It's the top set of DVS curves. There's the okay. first step is 0 0.9 volts, Got and then it. the second step is the 1.2 volt step. Okay, gotcha. And that's what they mean by it's open loop. It's in, and just internally in the ASIC or the SOC, it makes a decision to switch between those two. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the difference between the the top um, curve, the top group of curves of the DVS curves, and the um, the grouped AVS curves, you can see that difference is a guard band that um, for AVS, since you 
compensate for process and temperature variations so you can operate at a lower voltage when DVS isn't... Um, it's worst case. Yeah, it's worst case process and temperature still. So you still have that guard band of um, that's the room for the improvement that ABS can offer versus DVS. Okay. A question that just came in, a couple questions that just came in. Um, the first question is, what does the power curve look like without DVS? It's, a, it's basically a straight line. Uh, it's a linear line that goes up without that step in it. So as you go up right. in frequency, if you look at the power consumption of CMOS, it's linear with frequency. So as the frequency would move up, the uh, the power dissipation would move up as well. Okay. Yeah. Let's say you probably just operate 1.2 volt. You just said it at 1.2 volt, time. but if you look at the power dissipation, it'll be linear with uh, frequency. Okay. Next next question is also related to to DBS, and it's, you know, basically what are the benefits to DBS? So they're... There has to be a few benefits to it. So what are some, some of the benefits to it? Um, some of the benefits to, to DVS, right, is that um, if you're looking... So there, there are some, um, some processors or, or SOC or um, digital logic where you can implement um, a uh, voltage regulator to go into two steps like this, for example, like 0.9 to 1.2, okay. where... Um, the processor can just take advantage of basically has two mode um, idle and then full full speed right so then you can apply okay the lower voltage um, for the idle and then the higher voltage for the full um, full speed and then the voltage regulator can go you know has a pin that says okay low and high and then just operate at only those two voltage so basically there are some benefits there of um, of you know ease of use as far as ease easy to to implement. Yeah to implement and design. However, though, on the power saving, you're not getting as much as a, what ABS would offer you. It's a trade-off. Right. Okay. So Okay. So there are some benefits to that, but the power saving definitely is, is not as good as ABS. So. Okay, great. Um, let's see, the next question is, are the power savings being depicted with the chip being always on, 100% powered all the time? In other words, the sections of the ASIC are not being shut down when not in use? Yeah, in this particular case, uh, it's apples to apples. So if we just took a, a CMOS process and we varied its frequency and we implemented DVS and we also implemented AVS, this would be the difference between the two. But if you start to shut down sections of your ASIC, or if you do frequency, in this particular case, we're frequency scaling, right? We're moving it up and down. Uh, obviously, there's benefits to that. But this does not depict any kind of uh, shutdown. Right. I mean, it's, yeah. So whether the, the process is operating in different modes, shut down and doing anything, it doesn't have any system implications, whether if you apply, um, implement ABS in that system versus if you were doing a fixed voltage scheme. So Okay. Uh, next question. ABS implies that something within the ASIC instructs our IP that the silicon is of the slow, typical, or fast batch. Is, is, is that correct? And if so, how is that determined? Yeah, that's the uh, actual hardware performance monitor, and that's, that uh, intellectual property is what determines that. And it, it looks at the performance of the actual part, and, uh, and then it communicates that to the APC. Okay. Uh, another question. Um, these power numbers seem to be based on simulations. How well do they match actual silicon results? Great question. So question, yeah. what, um, what we'll see actually in, in um, the next few slides are actually some measured results um, of the examples that we'll have in the real demonstrations with, with um, measured results. So we can compare that. Um, but this one is a great, um, uh, great graph to be able to see the different temperature um, and also the DVS versus AVS. Okay. Perfect. So that's why we chose this one to demonstrate that. Okay, but. great. I think we can go okay. on. That's, that's it for questions for now. So in the, so here you can see actually for, for this slide um, the comparison between all three different schemes, fixed DVS and AVS, where you can see that fixed doesn't compensate for process or temperature or frequency scaling. So you're always applying, in this case, the maximum um, voltage that you would apply, 1.2 volt. And DVS, you can see that the voltage on the DVS um, scale with frequency, but it does not compensate for process or temperature. So you can see that the AVS um, voltage at each of the frequent frequency level, the voltage of the AVS is always lower than um, the DVS because it accounts for both process and temperature. And you basically reclaim the guard band. Right. So this is a great way to... Um, to kind of demonstrate that, the voltage, different voltage level that you can see clearly. 
So to talk a, a little bit about the AVIS technology in general and um, the status of um, what has happened and the deployment so yeah. far, is that um, the AVS technology has been invented since um, the year 2000. So it's, it's a very much mature technology. We have over 20 plus patents um, in this technology and um, various licenses uh, worldwide. And the public licenses, um, somebody maybe had asked that question of um, who, yeah, who are available, yeah. right? Um, so the public licenses um, that we have that had implemented AVS is um, Samsung Semiconductor and um, Terranetics. Um, so, and then we, we'll have some of the example for the Terranetics um, applications um, in the later slide as well. So, um, the technology is process and architecture independent. So, we have implemented in um, 130, 180, 350 nanometer and already have two released uh, IP generations, APC1 and APC2. And we're actually about to um, release the APC3 in the next month or two. So. Our customer have implemented in the 90 and also 65 nanometer process. So as you can see that um, the technology can be used in uh, various process um, geometry. And it's also architecture independent, so it's actually a, a fairly um, flexible, flexible platform yeah. okay. for you to adopt. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, I think there was a question also about the system, of how this AVS impact the system as well. Um, so first, AVS is an implementation that goes on top. It's completely transparent of what the processor function is doing. What it's doing is that it sends, it sends the information in the profile and um, communicate that to the energy management unit to apply the optimized power management delivery to the processor. So it does not interfere with the, the system, the um, processor implementation um, functions or, or performance at all. So it doesn't. Yeah, it's just do continuously that. optimizing right. the system as it's doing its thing. So it doesn't get in the way. Yeah, so it does not impact the system performance at all. Yeah. What it does impact though is the system energy savings. Um, so it does save the that that entire system because a better optimized um, power management delivery, um, it, you can expect a saving between 20 to 50 percent based on you know different um, process geometries and things. And we'll go into different examples that you can see that. And that's versus like a fixed VDD. Right. Right. So, right. Yeah. And the saving will depend on you know the process geometry you use, design implementation, frequency scaling. Um, profile. Well. So some of the examples that you're going to highlight, they'll depict the impact mm -hmm. of, of ABS right. on, on system energy savings. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So in this particular application, you can see uh, what we've done at the top curve is uh, this is an ARM uh, 9, uh, 926 core, and we had uh, at the top curve it shows a fixed VDD, and it, it's accumulating the amount of energy that's consumed in this particular application. The second curve below it shows a DVS turned on and, and, and how much savings during that same process time um, was, was accumulated. Then the last curve on the bottom, the red line, is the uh, AVS technology turned on, and that shows a 42% savings over the, uh, the fixed VDD. So it's, it's quite significant, and this is actually, I believe, measured data. Right. So you can see the platforms in the, on the bottom that it's implemented in this test chip on the 926 ARM 926 core, and um, I think I would say that this saving, um, which is a measured result, it's comparable to the one that we've just seen previously mm -hmm. from the yeah. simulated result with the same, you know, 139. Yeah, it's, it's very typical. So, um, another example for um, implementing AVS is that you can implement AVS in uh, multiple domains, um, processor or ASIC, and um, with today's uh, example with, you know, handset devices, the processors are actually being very much uh, sophisticated and usually they're either dual cores and now they're coming up with um, e even much more, even more. Um, complex type of processors mm -hmm. where it does so many different functions and dif different domains. So with this example, um, AVS is actually being implemented in um, both of the cores, um, dual, dual ARM 7 um, CPU cores. And um, basically, you can utilize AVS to to voltage scale each of these um, domains separately yeah. at the same time. So you can see HPMs are um, implemented in this uh, the small green um, block there. So you can see the size of it. Yeah, these are actually relative to the rest of the uh, right. geometry of this particular design. So it gives you an idea how big those components of that intellectual property are. They're very small. 
Right. So in this example, how big are the HPM and, and APC? The, well, you can see if you look, the uh, APC is the larger green block, and okay. the uh, uh, HPM right, so is the smaller. A, so relative to the to size scale. of the die, right. it's to scale with the okay. particular part. Yeah, you can see that it doesn't take that much room. And um, actually, the the picture that you see on um, the screen is actually the, the chip that we have here um, in the studio that is running right now um, in this demonstration kit. So what it's doing is that... Um, Actually, the, the dual core of this processor is um, a connectivity processor, an image processor that's in here. And what we're doing here is we're running a, um, a slideshow of images um, continuously, and we're, we're running that um, where the image is being projected and the data is being processed by both you know, the processor where these are being implemented. And you can see the results. Um, of the AVS impact um, in the next slide, which this is, is... This is actually pretty interesting. Um, this is the same task repeated over and right. over. Um, in the, the first section, there's actually, you can see there's frequency scaling occurring within the device. But the blue it's a, line. The blue line, the lower blue line. The sort of teal line, I guess, yeah. we should pick better colors. I guess. The uh, teal <laughs> line there at the top shows the fixed VDD, and so the, the energy consumption there uh, it accumulates at the bottom, and that gives us sort of our baseline. So the same scaling is going to continue in each one of the uh, scenarios. The, uh, so, so that uh, accumulated energy with 100% is, is what we're going to compare to. The next uh, grouping is uh, DVS, and you can actually see that the uh, voltage, the VDD voltage, is being scaled as well along with frequency, uh, and that saved about 20% of the energy uh, from just a fixed VDD, and that's the next uh, the accumulated curve there below on the bottom where it's uh, circled 80%. Yeah. Then when you turn AVS on, you, again, take into consideration now any kind of temperature and process variation and remove the guard bands, and you can get all the way down to uh, 57%. The same kind of thing is occurring. Uh, AVS is uh, actively uh, closing the loop and adapting the VDD to the performance required. So it, it actually gets it down to 57% of what the original power was. So it's pretty significant uh, right. savings. And if you track the uh, the voltage or the teal line of the AVS DVS, you can compare the level of the voltage as well. Um, that for each frequency level, the AVS voltage is lower, much lower than DVS voltage. So on the left hand side of the axis, people might have a question. So basically, it's um, it's a multi unit ax <laughs> axis. Yes, so so on the blue line, you can think of it as um, megahertz. Unit, okay. and then for the voltage, you can see that um, just put a decimal on there, so it would be like either point, volts, yeah, so one point two volt for the fixed voltage. That would be the um, the units. So you can kind of look at it and analyze it more um, with those units and see the okay. difference. Question that just came in: Does each AVS domain use its own separate voltage input from our power part? Yeah, actually, each voltage domain has uh, the EMU has a separate control output for each voltage domain. It has different, um, right? But the question is: a separate input? Separate voltage input from our power part. The, so the device itself, the ABS domain. Does so yeah. So the ABS domain, each ABS um, output voltage will be separate to each of the domain, but okay. the input to the voltage regulator, the either EMU, is the, it's the a same. single. Yeah. Okay. Uh, another question that came in, what processor were these results taken from and how were the tests run? So this one is actually, if I can go back one, one slide, Ray, is it's done on the 130 nanometer TSMC process. Okay. It's a dual ARM7 core. And um, the result is measured is, is running a dryer stone um, run, which means that it's just running the slideshow continuously. And what we did is we implemented different cycles of how the voltage is being applied. Okay. For, so fixed, DVS, and ABS. So and that's how we measured the results. Okay. And these are actually measured from that test chip. Right. Got it. And we've gotten a couple questions about the demo, too, just for folks who are joining us live. Okay. Live today, you, you can't see the video live right now, but we encourage you to access the on-demand version of today's webinar to, to, to see the, the demo we're showing in the mm -hmm. studio, too. That'd be fine. <clears throat> uh, as we mentioned earlier, there were um, uh, several public licensees, and one is the, the Terranetics um, 10 gigabit base T phi. Um, Terranetics uh, took a look at what they were doing and said, you know, if we put a whole bunch of these things into a box, like the, the original TN1010, they're, they're dissipating on the order of 240 watts for a 24-port application. So as they migrated to their new technology, uh, they included uh, PowerWise and was able to... Uh, 
lower the amount of energy consumed in each of their FIs uh, considerably so that if you build the same 24-port switch with the newer FIs and uh, ABS, you get the uh, energy down to about 144 watts for that same um, set of equipment. So this translates to uh, if you had a rack full of equipment on the order of 500 to 1,000 watt savings, which is considerable when you think of large infrastructures and large data centers uh, and looking at cost of ownership for these particular things over time, plus any kind of legislation that says, you know, you have to lower your energy consumption. This is something that's it's, it's much beyond the handset market. This is a very significant uh, energy savings. Yeah, and this is a great example um, where Teranetics uh, adopt the AVS, um, implemented it along with their technology to yep. further reduce, um, you know, the power energy consumption. consumption. Right in the in these type of applications, where when it's being implemented, like Rick mentioned, in in um, a large scale of configurations where tens of these are being used for each yeah. system, and then multiply by hundreds of systems, then um, the power savings is huge. Okay. And the, to sum it up on the benefits and the implementations um, for AVS, so for the energy saving. Um, with AVS in being implemented, you can actually get a significant um, reduction compared to the fixed or the DVS um, scheme of power management delivery. Um, also, as we talked a little bit about, um, you can also eliminate um, binnings and um, optimizing for that process and temperature variation. So in the saving, you'll see that it will depend on process geometry. We talked a little bit about that, of how it varies um, based on that. And also the design implementation of it and um, the frequency scaling profile is also important as well. It will determine of how much um, more energy savings that you can do in that. Um, on the implementations end, um, since we talked um, a little bit more that the IP needs to be um, um, implemented in the processor and the ASIC and SOC, um, it's actually a synthesizable IP, which is made for a very flexible um, flexibility into the system integration. Um, and as we have seen that AVS has been invented since the year 2000, so we actually have um, very, very established infrastructure of how to implement this um, IP into um, our customers' ASICs and, and processors. So that way it enables a very seamless implementation um, to them. And in order, so there were a, a question that came up of how, how do we make sure we verify um, that you know the timing and closure, everything is working properly. So we work closely um, with the ASIC and processor developer in order to um, implement this technology in there to ensure that the implementation is successful. It is working, um, you know, together well with our um, energy management unit as well. And so we have various tools um, to to do this um, seamlessly to the customer. So to sum it up, it's, it's fairly um, a minimum system overhead in order to implement this technology. Okay. And um, if you'd like to learn more about uh, adaptive voltage scaling technology, you can go to the website that um, is shown on your screen. Um, you can see the solution information, um, lots of white paper and articles that, um, that you can read about more and the details on. And products and evaluation, sh evaluation kits are also available as well. Um, you can uh, ask, if you have more questions on how to implement the AVS um, into your system, you can contact your local um, national salesperson, or you can submit a feedback through the AVS website, um, and you just select the AVS category, and we'll make sure to get back to you on that. Okay, great. Well, thank you to both of you for joining us today. A few Thanks, last things in closing as well. Uh, as with most of our webinars, there is a short 10-question uh, multiple-choice assessment associated with this webinar as well. If you can take a few minutes to complete that, to test what you learned in today's session, that would be great. As always, your feedback is really important as well. We have a short evaluation also associated with this webinar, and we really do take a look at all those. So we look at all of your comments, your feedback, your suggestions. It's very helpful to hear all of that in terms of planning future training sessions. So with that said, thanks again for watching this webinar, and enjoy the rest of your day.